Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, the latest in our series of public lectures here at the Noble Institute in Oslo. It is our great uh, pleasure that we uh, welcome uh, senior lecturer David Snyder from the University of South Carolina. Uh, David Snyder uh, got his uh, undergrad education from the University of Illinois. He uh, had his postgrad uh, degrees from uh, the University of Wyoming and Southern Illinois. And uh, currently he is at the University of South Carolina. Professor Snyder is here to uh, give a lecture on a fascinating topic, uh, one that is very close to my own heart. Uh, the theme of today's lecture is a European encounter with the American century, modernization, clientelism, and the uses of sovereignty during the early Cold War. And today, dear friends, we're going to hear a case study approach to this experience that so many European countries have gone through uh, this ever close and tempestuous relations with Americanism and, and the United States. And the case in, uh, uh, in, in question is the Netherlands. Professor Snyder, the floor is yours. Well, thank you uh, very much. I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be here with you all this afternoon. I want to give my profound thanks to uh, the Institute, uh, to Dr. Asla Toya, the Institute staff who are, uh, have just been uh, marvelous. I thank them for their invitation to come, their many hospitalities. Uh, the Norwegian Nobel Institute, of course, is one of the world's preeminent research centers for international relations, and I'm immensely proud to be here. I also want to recognize my wife, Dr. Saskia Kunin Snyder, who accompanied me to Oslo, uh, and our four-year-old son, Dashiell, sitting in the back there. This is Dashi's first experience hearing Daddy uh, lecture publicly, I should add. He certainly heard plenty of private lectures. Um, uh, I also want to re recognize my friend and colleague who's here today, Dr. Halvard uh, Nodeker. It is undoubtedly wise not to acknowledge one's debts in public, uh, but it is certainly true that I wouldn't be here today without the contact Halvard and I had made several years ago, which was the beginning of a collaboration that produced an earlier conference here at the Institute um, uh, a book on American public diplomacy soon to be on the shelves in September, I'm happy to announce, um, and ultimately uh, this lecture. It's been a fruitful partnership, I think, Halvard, and I trust we have more projects in store. Uh, I'd also like to recognize the Institute's eminent former director, Dr. Geir Lundestad, who's here today, whom I had the pleasure of meeting during our conference in 2013. Uh, Dr. Lundestad, of course, is a prolific scholar of international relations whose work is well known in any number of diplomatic history circles. By a fortunate confluence of circumstances, that work provides a substantial part of the intellectual foundation of uh, what I want to discuss today. Uh, Professor Lindestead is perhaps best known for his theory that US power during the middle part of the 20th century constituted a, quote, empire by invitation. In a series of important articles and books beginning in the mid-1980s, Lindestad argued that post-World War II American power can be understood as an empire that was constituted not by a conventional will to power, but by the solicitations of the war-damaged European nations who availed themselves of American economic aid and investments, military protection, and political support. Thus, what we have is an empire that does not from the metropolitan core, but from the periphery. Yet for me, a curious fact is that wherever Lundestad's work is cited among American historians, that particular phrase, empire by invitation, is always quoted directly as if it were a brand or a trademark or perhaps even a totem. The phrase empire by invitation is offered as if it were a thing unto itself, something of a curio one picks off the shelf, inspects, but then carefully sets back so as to not to disturb it. One may look, but close inspection may damage the precious thing. It is as if American scholars are so glad of the agency implied by the word invitation, which seems to drain the word empire of its conventional associations with dominance and conquest, that they don't want to damage the phrasing with too careless handling. If the European states wanted it, it can't really be empire. 
So it is in much of the American scholarship, empire gets euphemized into more pleasant sounding categories, such as hegemony or recently ascendancy. One clever historian in an attempt to deny empire by recourse to a genial baseball metaphor has likened the United States not to an empire, but to an umpire, someone who sets the rules and regulates the game albeit in this case an umpire who was, this historian allows, quote, also a player and therefore never completely above the game. I must add here parenthetically that if I wanted to think of a metaphor for empire, I could hardly do worse than player umpire. William Appleman Williams' insight of more than 50 years ago has it exactly right when he observed that, quote, one of the central themes of American historiography is that there is no American empire. This afternoon, I'll ask you to consider Lundestad's formulation of an empire by invitation in the Netherlands as a point of departure rather than arrival, and to consider the agency implied at both ends of this imperial axis, indicated in the phrasing that invitations can be made and imperial power exerted. If the US is not an empire after all, then some other explanation for the long unbroken history of territorial conquest, commercial domination, forcible regime change, political interference, and frequent military excursion must be offered. Direct territorial conquest, owing to the expense of taking, maintaining, and administering such territory, is the strategy most often disavowed by imperialists themselves. Rather, as Lundestad's work shows, conquest is just one of a buffet of tactics and strategies available to empires, all of which may produce greater or lesser successes given contingent factors. Lundestad's insight that subordinate states within the imperial system can leverage imperial power and that empires may welcome such invitations for their own purposes deserves fuller consideration than it has thus far gotten within the American scholarship. An imperial strategy that leverages the sovereignty of nation states is a counterintuitive approach to empire, given the tendency among liberal internationalists, such as I presume most of us, to think of empire in terms of outright domination. Unlike the work of empire in the developing world, with its regimes of domination and control, post-war American strategies in Europe seem less like disciplining methodologies than like negotiated agreements between sovereign powers fully credentialed to settle accounts. But the difference is that US policymakers were not near, merely seeking to make deals. They also sought to alter the political and cultural substrate on which deal making was occurring. A proper theory of empire requires recognizing that the United States constituted an empire in the post-war world because American culture provided a powerful model of emulation and critique and also that the United States exerted the power to alter the environment in which acceptance of that model became more likely. American statesmen were not merely existing in the world, they were trying to change the world. The Marshall Plan, for example, was not merely about teaching more efficient methods of production, it was also designed to offer a new language and a new economic grammar in which the knowledge advocated by officials would come to be seen as natural and hence eminently reproducible while contrary arrangements seemed unnatural, even offensive. Insofar as sovereignty itself did not seem to be violated in such transactions, it has been difficult for some of my American colleagues to render the transformative imperial power which was actually occurring. I've chosen a less poetic way to refer to this strategy than Lundestad, however. I call the tactic clientelism, by which I mean one of the particular strategies of empire. At its core, a clientelist approach stresses relations rather than, as conventional in diplomatic history, episodes, crises. Clients are nominally independent states, but not subjugated. The client does not belong to the metropolitan center of the empire, but neither is the client a vassal. The client comprises part of a third dimension of empire that exists in dynamic relation to the metropolitan center and to the exploited or conquered periphery, but also in relation to the powers that exist outside the imperial system, traditionally the barbarians beyond, uh, beyond the frontier. In this case, I refer, of course, to the Bolsheviks behind the curtain. Crucially important to understand is that the sovereignty of the client is preserved, but the client possesses limited freedom of action. 
Clientelism, let me emphasize, preserves the sovereignty of the nation state, not as an alternative to empire, but as a key constituent of empire. In the limited literature on clientelism that exists, scholars tend to emphasize the security needs of patrons and development needs of clients, and hence the exchange of economic aid and technical expertise of the patron offered for the geographical, strategic, or security considerations by the client. The dominant motif is the flow of power in one direction uh, uh, to the client from the patron. But clientelism offers benefits other than those premised on patron security and which flow both ways. To the patron, the retained sovereignty of the nation state client demonstrates the legitimacy of the imperial mission. For the client, military protection, economic development aid, and even cultural support comprise important benefits for which sovereign states may be willing to trade away some portion of their freedom of action. So we need a more robust understanding of clientelism than what currently predominates in the international relations literature. I identify four key components of this clientelist framework. First, the recognition that conventional geographies of empire with their exploiting metropoles and exploited periphery are insufficient. Clientelism recognizes what we might call a mid-core of sovereign states that are actors in their own right, despite their envelopment within the imperial system. At the mid-core, disparities of power are preserved, but so too the sovereignty typically associated with the modern nation state. Second, clientelism recognizes power not only at the metropole, but also at and within the mid-core client strata. Client agency, by which I mean the capacity to render the imperial presence as a native force of political, cultural, and economic life, means that clients of the US national security state have purchase on American power that could be harnessed to local ends, instrumentalized to national purposes. Third, clientelism entails what Paul Kramer calls the, quote, complex circuits of agency between the metropole and the client, those political, cultural, economic, and intellectual networks between and among agents that would not exist without the imperial relationship. Elite groups, corporate and business cooperation, cultural connections, academic and scholarly networks, and more flourish within the imperial system. One historic example of these clientelist networks would be the mid-level program officers and functionaries, as Helga Danielson has noted, within the Marshall Plan agencies, the US Information Services, the military advisory groups, and other local policy implementation teams. The Americans in these networks often became advocates for local interests, gone native in an earlier parlance, while local members of such networks often became interlocutors for the imperial presence. Ernst van der Bugel, for example, one of the leading Dutch Atlanticists of his generation, remarked how American Marshall Plan officials in The Hague, quote, found themselves right in the middle of policy and in spheres which belonged to the privacy of national sovereignty. Certainly the storied Fulbright program is the best example of these imperial networks in the scholarly world, perhaps my presence here, another such example. Um, fourth, and perhaps most crucially, clientelism means the delivery of mutual benefits. The metropole delivers economic, security, and even cultural benefits to the client in exchange for the demonstrated loyalty of the nation state, what Charles Mayer calls the, quote, voluntary adhesion of the client. The Netherlands is a useful case in which to examine clientelism in action. The significance of the Netherlands and of American-Dutch relations in general is not captured in traditional diplomatic history with its emphasis on realpolitik and bilateral relations. The English language literature on post-war US-Netherlands relations is vanishingly small. The Netherlands, it is supposed, possessed no real hard power, and so having no international leverage is hardly worthy of study. Yet U.S. strategists certainly did not dismiss the Netherlands. The Joint Chiefs of Staff in 1947 issued a report that correlated global areas of strategic interest against the economic need and potential of those areas. Because of its Caribbean and Pacific colonies, the Joint Chiefs judged the Netherlands the fifth most strategically important country to U.S. interests, behind Britain, France, Germany, and Belgium. But it is not the strategic value of the Netherlands that recommends itself to a study of clientelism. Rather, it is the apparent asymmetry of power 
between the Netherlands and the US that interests us. The transactions of client relations, the agency of the client, and the power of the empire are clearly seen throughout US-Dutch relations. Dutch politics, for example, bears the traces of the American influence visible throughout the putatively sovereign Netherlands. France and Italy, frankly, are better cases of this influence uh, of US power within domestic political cultures, and those have been well documented. In Italy, for example, the Americans promoted de Gasperi's Christian Democrats in a number of immediate ways, including extending the private networks that helped to galvanize popular support for the party, infiltrating and diluting the party's presumed labor opposition, feeding its personalities, propagandizing its supporters, waging psychological warfare against its opponents, and galvanizing emigre support from across the waters. Direct US involvement in Dutch politics was less spectacular than in Italy. Political warfare, for example, as the phrase has been used in the Italian context, seems too strong a description for the Dutch case. But the American presence undoubtedly helped make this period unprecedented in Dutch political history. The post-war Dutch, go Dutch government was dominated by the famous Red Roman Coalition of Social Democrats and the Partij van de Arbeid, the Dutch Labor Party, the PVDA, and the Catholic People's Party, the KVP. This storied coalition of socialists and Catholics, like many historical monuments, no longer offers much wonder. But at the time, this government was a marvel in Dutch history, an unprecedented melding together of two historic opposites. It is true that by this time, the Dutch socialists had lost much of their revolutionary elan, but their assumption of governing responsibilities was nevertheless a historic novelty in the Netherlands. Much of the post-war socialist governing legitimacy had come from their enviable resistance record during the war, but wartime resistance provides only part of the answer to why the Dutch came to consider the Labor Party a responsible governing organ. The socialists had sought and won American favor as well, and the promises of future American support became linked to social democratic electoral victory. It took a little time for the State Department uh, to become convinced that the Labor Party would be a reliable partner. Much of the diplomatic literature is about assuaging the Americans that the socialists can be trusted and can be worked with. Uh, certainly in the person of Willem Dres, the dominant political figure of these years, and as stolid and bourgeois a socialist as ever trod the earth, the Americans were much reassured. Many other prominent party leaders became frequent guests of the embassy. Trade union leaders, such as Kos Forink, writers and intellectuals, such as Jacques Decat, newspaper leaders, such as Franz Goodhart, editor-in-chief of Het Parole, then as now the most important labor daily in the Netherlands. Social Democrats also monopolized the foreign leader grants from the State Department, and socialist trade union leaders and rank-and-file members often visited the US on productivity study trips associated with the Marshall Plan thus constituted one of those networks about which I previously spoke, offering the Americans back-channel access to Dutch political life as Dutch labor leaders became strong advocates for the Marshall Plan, NATO, and Atlanticism in general, within a broader workers' constituency generally disposed to be suspicious of American policy. The Catholics, by contrast, and at least until the mid-1950s, were much more cool to the American presence. American power, in other words, and I developed this more at length in some of the um, articles I'm working on, American power helped to sift and legitimate domestic political choices, all the while appearing to remain neutral in that arena. The story of American involvement in the recovering and integrating post-war European economies has been well told and often told, but it is worth a moment's reflection because the story of American and European economic entanglement so well illustrates the negotiated transactions, the give and take, acceptance and resistance that characterizes clientelism. As many scholars have pointed out, the Marshall Plan offered the participating countries working capital with which the Americans hoped to promote industrial efficiency, trade liberalization, economic growth, and ultimately the continental integration that would render further American sacrifices unnecessary. What the Europeans wanted, and certainly in particular the Dutch, was a new welfare state that would redeem the sacrifices of the war years and drain the domestic political seas of class conflict. 
these separate political and, e and economic agendas became reconciled within each country via the mechanism of the imperial networks of which we are speaking, typically the Marshall Plan country missions, which buzzed with activity and representation. In some nations, Marshall Plan funds went to debt relief or monetary stabilization. In the Netherlands, much of it was channeled to new industrial investment. Later in the life of the Marshall Plan, the Americans sought to increase the efficiency of Dutch production during the so-called productivity drive. The ideological justification of the productivity drive, as Charles Mayer pointed out some years ago in an important essay, was that class conflict could be solved through economic growth, as it allegedly was in the United States. Study trips consultations and publications, even the outfitting of two traveling canal barges through the Netherlands, all touted the miracles to be won to Dutch production by the adoption of American work methods. Yet in the main, Dutch workers and even many companies were unimpressed. Certain techniques commanded attention, but American factories were often cited as soulless temples of mechanization. The parking lots bigger than the factory floor spoke to an irrepressible American materialism, and even the American kitchen, that efficient factory writ small, was rejected as inappropriately gadgety. The Netherlands is no America, concluded the report of one early study trip, and the Dutch should not sacrifice their balanced wages policy, deeper social security provisions, or their tradition of handcrafted qualitates production on the uh, altar of American productivity. The politics of productivity as such failed, though not for lack of trying, as the chairman of the primary Dutch productivity organ, W.H. von Leeuwen put it, the technical assistance program was, quote, an American blessing in Dutch translation. Differences in mentality, in the economic structure, and in, what, and in relations between employer and worker, Van Leeuwen insisted, do not permit one country to accept blindly the ideas or methods of another. Yet even if the Dutch rejected key elements of the American model, infusions of American cash did solve some important political problems of the early 1950s, especially those associated with defense policy. The productivity drive had been formulated at a moment of deep crisis in the early Western alliance. American demands for new European commitments to collective defense clashed with European reconstruction and reinvestment plans. Productivity was a way to square this circle as economic gains would be channeled into military expenditure. In the Netherlands, Marshall Plan aid, now in the form of the Mutual Security Agency, plus commitments to the Mutual Defense Assistant Program, that was the American aid to the NATO countries, plus offshore procurement purchases, meant that the Netherlands could pursue a guns and butter fiscal policy through much of the early 1950s. American propaganda via the Marshall Plan Country Mission, as well as the US Information Service, reassured nervous Dutch workers and consumers that the real wages cuts they were experiencing were necessary and were backed by equal American commitments to collective defense. I've spoken briefly about clientelism in Dutch politics and in the political economy. In the time I have remaining, I want to offer a few details about Dutch foreign policy, especially the resolution of the so-called Indonesian crisis as perhaps the clearest example of the leverage clientelism seemed to offer the client state and did, in fact, offer the Metropolitan Center. Typically, the episode is periodized from 1945 to 1949, from the end of the war to that period when the Dutch were forced to hand over sovereignty uh, 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 to the Indonesians, and there's often a New Guinea epilogue, if you will, in the early 1960s. As conventionally told, American power woke up to Dutch designs after the first police action in the summer of 1947, sharpened during the second police action in late 1948, at which time the, quote, big stick, that's one of the phrases used in the literature, the big stick was brought out. The Americans threatened to withhold martial aid unless the Dutch stood down. Dutch officials at the time interpreted this as a kind of blackmail. Foreign Minister Dirk Sticker later wrote with resentment at the, quote, unrelenting pressure put upon us by our allies to grant Indonesian independence. 
Scholars have therefore generally approached U.S.-Netherlands relations in the Indonesian crisis as a story of dawning American power colliding with Dutch recalcitrance. In this conventional view, Dutch-Indonesian policy is finally and precipitously terminated by the deus ex machina of American anti-colonialism. The resulting clash, another word frequent in the scholarship, seeming to catch Dutch officials unawares as they suddenly realize the power of the United States. Yet the story of US involvement in the East Indies crisis does not begin in 1947 or 1948, but years earlier when Dutch officials came to understand the dawning of the American century. In 1946, for example, Ambassador Alexander Loudon, he's the Dutch ambassador to the US, had referred ironically to the threat of an American, quote, economic empire in the region, seeking both raw materials and strategic advantage as a clear threat to Dutch sovereignty. But in point of fact, most Dutch observers tended to see American power in the region as a rampart of Dutch control, not a threat to it. As early as 1939, for example, future foreign minister Herman van Rooyen linked American power to Dutch preeminence in the region, writing in his diary that, quote, so long as America maintains an interest in the Pacific, our colonies are relatively secure. The Dutch declaration of war on Japan immediately after the attack on Pearl Harbor, but before the Japanese assault on the East Indies, must be seen as the opening gambit in a bid to win American support for Dutch interests in the region. After the Japanese conquest of the archipelago, that's in March 1942, the observations became sharper. In 1942, James Housinga, son of the great Dutch historian Johan Housinga, uh, and at the time deputy director of the Netherlands Information Bureau in New York, this is the Dutch propaganda agency in the US, recognized the problem of Dutch powerlessness in the East Indies. Quote, we are now almost entirely dependent on the goodwill of America for the restoration of our authority in the region, Housinga wrote in a memo to his superiors. In American eyes, Housinga explained, to demand the return of Dutch sovereignty in Indonesia without the power to make that happen was foolish and counterproductive. The Dutch would have to learn that it was the Americans who would soon hold all the cards. Quote, this time America is of no mind to restore the balance of the old world, only return to the new world after the work is done. Housing a wrote, perhaps somewhat ominously, this time it is to, the, to be the American century anywhere and everywhere. Thus, during the war and after, as a nationalist movement began to take shape and advocate in Indonesia, a dedicated Dutch public diplomacy campaign in the United States came to battle American anti-colonialism and actively solicited American interest at the grassroots level. This campaign propounded themes calculated to win American support and sympathy, such as the, the efficacy of Dutch modernization efforts in the Indies, that Dutch expertise was sorely needed in the region, and that the nationalist movement was tainted by collaborationism with the Japanese and later became a puppet of Moscow. Nevertheless, the public diplomacy campaign is a good example, I think, of Professor Lundestad's invitationalism as the Dutch sought to bring their mounting conflict in the Pacific into the adjudicatory orbit of American power. These years were shot through with Dutch appeals to American power. The Dutch requested to extend Marshall Plan aid separately to the East Indies, a provision which would later offer the Americans additional leverage in the region. While generally aggrieved toward the UN, the Dutch got hammered in the General Assembly and the Security Council, the Dutch nevertheless enthusiastically accepted the UN's offer of a good offices committee after the first police action in the summer of 1947, which they expected to be American dominated, which it was, and hence friendly to their cause, rather than having the Security Council deal directly with the crisis. The pursuit of imperial networks was also part of the Dutch Indonesian strategy. They cultivated American officials, such as Consul General in Batavia, Walter Foote, who became highly sympathetic despite the militarism associated with Dutch colonial policy. For Foote, it was obvious that while the Dutch were not blameless for the cycles of violence, quote, to any impartial observer here, guilt lies almost entirely with the Indonesian militarists. Foote was convinced that the American press was, quote, poorly informed of the true nature of the republic. 
His reports detail the litany of Indonesian crimes, including smuggling, shooting and kidnapping peasants, bad faith on the part of military leaders, the ongoing taint of Japanese influence, and alleged support of the nationalist movement from Australian communists. Foote concluded that the time was ripe for the Americans to reconsider their general openness at the time toward the republic. The most important example of Dutch clientelism, however, came after the announcement of the Truman Doctrine in March 1947, by which the Americans famously asserted a duty to oppose communism anywhere in the world, and which marked the beginning of a sea change in Dutch foreign policy thinking. The Dutch cabinet hoped that with the Truman Doctrine, quote, the Americans are quite prepared to accept the serious consequences ensuing from the president's stated position. Given the complete preoccupation with the Indonesian crisis for the cabinet in those years, there can be no doubt as to the consequences to which the ministers were referring. Within weeks of Truman's speech, the Dutch offered to the nationalist movement the landmark proposals of May 1947, which were meant to define the terms of implementation of the Lingajati Agreement, which had been signed the previous November. One historian who has looked at these proposals carefully calls them, quote, unmistakably aggressive. Proposing de jure Dutch sovereignty through early January 1949, control over external commerce and foreign relations, and a joint police force, I'm summarizing the terms here, even Dutch Lieutenant General H.J. Van Mock, acknowledged at the time as a Dutch liberal, um, uh, called the proposals an ultimatum. That's a quote. Within weeks of that ultimatum, and citing the crippling expenses of keeping troops stationed in the region, the necessity to plant and secure the 1949 sugar harvest, and the further erosion of Dutch finances, the Catholic Beale government, then in power, commenced hostilities in late July 1947. Robert McMahon notes the, quote, unmistakably pro-Dutch orientation, and the, quote, accommodating response from Washington toward the first police action, which the US never strongly opposed and, quote, may even have tacitly encouraged. In other words, a clientelist logic had taken hold. By the time of the first police action, the Truman Doctrine's universalist opposition to communism and the American commitment to economic recovery in Western Europe provided fresh justification and new strategies for Dutch claims to continued predominance in the archipelago. Once it became clear to Dutch policymakers that the Truman Doctrine signaled a new and hard-headed uh, American approach to the problem of world communism, Dutch policy would take an increasingly hard line, including the two police actions to suppress the Indonesian nationalist movement. The Cold War correspondingly gained increased salience in Dutch foreign policy circles as officials struggled to find valences and points of connection with American policy. Washington's congealing Cold War attitudes, in other words, encouraged Dutch obduracy. Rather than a, quote, clash of American and Dutch interests that occurred only in late 1948 and 1949, the crisis, rather, reveals itself through a clientelist lens as a long-term encounter, deeply committed to other aspects, or deeply connected to other aspects of the relationship, and subject to Dutch agency, overtures, and attempted leverage, at least as much, until the final denouement, as American. Some US officials understood the overdetermined interpretations the Dutch attached to the Truman Doctrine. U.S. Ambassador to the Netherlands, Herman Baruch, cabled Secretary Marshall that, quote, in urging the Dutch to refrain from use of force, we may have assumed high responsibility, we Americans, may have assumed high responsibility in settlement of Indonesian problem. This is a telegram. In other words, by counseling forbearance against the perceived best interests of the Dutch, the U.S. was putting itself in a position of responsibility for keeping Dutch forces on the leash. Baruch explicitly stated in the next line of his communique that U.S. pressure against the use of force has, quote, unquestionably aided bargaining position of Republican authorities, the Indonesian Republic. The U.S. must therefore urge Indonesian nationalists to, quote, be reasonable. Baruch implicitly understood how, by leveraging the clientelist relationship, the Dutch 
for inserting the Americans more directly into the dispute. By late 1948, of course, the Americans had not rejected the logic of containment, merely the Dutch fitting of Indonesia within it. They became convinced that further du Dutch action in the region contributed to the growth of communism and thus had to be shut down. Sticker threatened to pull the Netherlands out of NATO in 1949, but freedom of action had already been surrendered. The Americans were prepared to not only call Sticker's bluff, but to raise the ante by withholding Marshall Plan aid. The Dutch had traveled too far for empty threats of course reversal reversals to have much impact in Washington. I would highlight that the putative Dutch leverage in this case derived from their relationship, not from the threat itself. But locked as they were in the clientelist relationship, with freedom of action severely constrained, the choice was not theirs to make. In something of a sad coda, one of the last arguments to, to appear on behalf of Dutch colonialism was a book called The Stakes of Democracy in Southeast Asia by Lieutenant Governor General Van Moek. This book appeared in 1950. And despite Van Moek's liberal outlook, he presented a potted history of Dutch benefaction and an Orientalist anthropology already quickly becoming anachronistic. Van Mock had attempted to graft the Indonesian problem into a larger free world paradigm, where the stakes in Indonesia were not merely the Dutch economy, but democracy itself. One feels some sympathy for Van Mock, however, furiously putting together his volume, even as events passed the point of no return. Appearing in 1950, the book was immediately superfluous upon publication, a brief for an ancien regime that time and events had already swept away. Lundestad's phrasing of an invited empire is novel and I think confuses many American historians, but perhaps they can be forgiven a little. As the great classic scholar Ernst Badian has written, clientelism is a, quote, cloak for empire. Rome could afford to be generous and refrain from imposing formal obligations, Badian wrote, because she knew that she would have a strong moral claim on the states concerned and the power to remind them of it. American power forced the Dutch to accept new post-war realities, but also made the acceptance of those realities possible, even positive. This is the essence of clientelism and be can be seen most clearly with respect to the Indonesian crisis. With the colonies gone, and little leverage on German occupation policy, the only post-war course of action for the Netherlands would be a radical economic program focused on massive new industrial modernization and the pursuit of trade liberalization within an integrating Europe. This is why the Marshall Plan is so pivotal for Dutch history. If American power denied the recovery of the Indies, American power vouchsafed the possibility of a new industrial program and new trading partners to make that program profitable. The Dutch lost on Indonesia, but with American power won on so many other issues. The Marshall Plan, for example. They got much of what they wanted in the coal and steel arrangement. They want a greater degree of military security via NATO, and this includes, by the way, the defeat of the European defense community, which the Dutch secretly wanted because they did not want a French-dominated European force. Dutch Atlanticism in the period, therefore, should be seen as a form of clientelism, and crucial because the Dutch needed the Americans in Europe as a counterweight to France and Germany. Once the bitter disappointment of Indonesia was sorted out and the long struggle to win KLM landing rights was addressed, the succeeding period would become known in Dutch historiography as the heyday of Dutch Atlanticism. These are the years of Entral Bongenot, the faithful ally, as Alfred von Staden has put it. What clientelism gave, and whatever the particular outcome of the Indonesian affair, was power. The clientelist approach demands recognition of client agency. While the power of the American century emerged as a geopolitical fact after World War II, the exertion of that power still relied on choices made not only by US policymakers, but by officials in other capitals as well. American power appeared in highly contingent thus expropriatable form to policymakers and capitals such as The Hague. Clientelism meant that American power was never merely a big stick. In conclusion, an empire of nation states appears a peculiarity given our prevailing assumptions of state sovereignty in the modern era. 
But Americans had always been suspicious of the capacity of states to make mischief in the world, a conviction that intensified during and after the Wilson administration. American imperialism in the 20th century rested on the Wilsonian insight that nation states could be weakened enough to forestall conflict, yet retain sufficient strength to preserve global order. Supranational institutions, such as the UN, in conjunction with democracy promotion, would weaken states from above and below, calibrating state sovereignty to the demands of security and market both. For Wilson, the empires of the world would be, would be brought low through force. Nation states would be further weakened by democracy and by international cooperation. This is the Kantian notion that democratic states are perforce weak states. Thus, American support for the restoration of state sovereignties in the wake of both world wars were not so much acts of pure benevolence as they are often portrayed, but strategic considerations ensuring that states were made weak enough to allow for markets to extend themselves, but not so weak that those markets could not be protected. But there is another dimension not captured in this capsule history of liberal internationalism. Throughout the course of war and Cold War, the Americans also intruded their own exceptional power into the mix. The American empire would constitute yet another bridle on state power in the form of clientelism for those states so enrolled in the project. That so many of the clients invited this power, gave and gives ideological legitima legitimation to the imperial endeavor itself. Client states remain essential to empire because they demonstrate the essential benevolence of imperial cosmology. All empires need ideological legitimation. They need to demonstrate that what they claim is also what they do. Thus, the voluntary adhesion of client states offered both real and perceived benefits both to the client and to the metropole. It demonstrated to clients, vassals, and barbarians alike the essential benevolence of American power and that the American commitment to anti-imperialism, to self-determination, and to making the world safe for democracy were true. Thank you very much for your attention. There was some sterling effort. We will now take a 10 minute break and then we will rejoin for questions and answers. Thank you very much. and yet have uh, sovereign states nonetheless, and therefore the hegemonic state or a hegemon with significantly greater uh, political, economic, and military power resources may attempt, may, may attempt and win influence attempts over other states, weaker states, uh, more frequently, although the other states uh, nonetheless are sovereign and can defy the hegemon if they're willing to pay the uh, economic and political power prices. Uh, of doing so. Now, practically what that means is that an empire is a hierarchical uh, relationship uh, where authority rests in the emperor or in the state. So if you defy a core demand of Rome, then Rome is going to send the legions and compel you to do what they wish you to do. Now, uh, moving from uh, Dutch relations to a ground that I know better, American relations with France, that wasn't the nature of the American relationship with France. Uh, you know, the American core demand in 1950 was we need German rearmament uh, and you must consent to German rearmament. The French delayed that for four years and the Americans allowed them to delay that, even though they were pretty annoyed at the, at the whole business, but they allowed them to do that. More seriously, 1966, France withdrew from NATO. Uh, this is something that the Americans were apoplectic about. Uh, but ultimately, they allowed that to happen. There were no serious repercussions because in the end, the United States wasn't Rome, the United States was a hegemon. Compare that to what was going on on the Soviet side in 1968. Czechoslovakia wanted to go its own way to socialism and the tanks rolled in because you had an, uh, an imperial relationship where the empire uh, had the ability to coerce on things that mattered most, use force uh, for coercion uh, on things that mattered most. So that, I think, is a comparison between an imperial relationship and a hegemonic relationship. Uh, fast forward to 2003, France, again, uh, ultimately doesn't want to go ahead with the American uh, uh, action against Iraq. Now that is my own country, now that is uh, Belgium, now that is Germany, and, and, and we're pretty outspoken about the fact that it was uh, viewed by the French and by these other countries as illegitimate. In the end, 
uh, the United States tolerated that. That's a different and, and allowed that because the, the understanding was that these are sovereign countries that have the ability to decide on their own. Sure, we'll use whatever power resources we have at our disposal to try and prevent that. They'll do the same to us. We'll win more frequently. But in the in the end, it's something other than empire. So to call that empire uh, stretches the concept, I think, far too much. So I want to hear uh, what you have to think, say about that. I would. Um, uh, uh, I understand the distinction that you're uh, making. Professor, would, Professor Snyder, uh, Anne-Marie Le Gluarnik from Sciences Po would like to latch on to this question. Is that all right with you? As long as I don't forget my own answer, that's OK. I'm sorry, it, it has some relation with, with what Norrid says. Uh, I wanted to, to hear because you are talking, to get, uh, taking the French example, I wanted to hear to what extent the example, your case study you're, you're looking at is representative or telling us something about other clientelist relations between the United States and other countries uh, in Western Europe. Um, how does this fit? Uh, is there a pattern? And where it sort of rang a bell, I had this, the impression that you were a little bit tautological, but I'm not sure about that, was when you said that um, Dutch Atlanticism was a form of clientelism. But at the same time, as you know, there are more Atlanticist countries in Europe, and some others are not really Atlanticists. I mean, so how... I'm sorry, can you say there's more Atlanticist countries in Europe? That others, which are not particularly Atlanticist, France certainly is not, right? And, and uh, so there is, when you study um, strategic culture in Europe, I mean, you make the distinction between Atlanticist countries and others which are not even if they do belong to NATO. So I was wondering if you would have uh, one fit for all uh, 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 a kind of approach of, of a clientelism, or if you would have uh, different kind of patterns, but still fitting within the whole approach, but w still with nuances. I, I am a, a little bit puzzled by that. Yeah, well, certainly it's not a it's not a one size fits all category. Although, and try to address both of these concepts. This is in part why I'm making the argument within the imperial framework, because we typically think of an empire as having two dimensions: a metropole and a periphery, an exploiter and the exploited. And I, as I said in the talk, I'm wanting to add a third dimension to this, which we call client. And I'll circle back to Norris to your question about uh, the difference between empire and hegemony. I don't, um, I don't have the, the same expertise, obviously, in French or, or German or even uh, UK relations with the United States that I do with the Netherlands. So I absolutely would not insist on a one-size-fits-all um, category. Clearly. Uh, in fact, as I have said elsewhere and in sort of other iterations of this work, one of the things that makes the, the, the Netherlands interesting to me is precisely um, the uniqueness or the apparent uniqueness of the pattern compared with other European nations. Once the colonies were gone, and that was a traumatic, that's, I don't want to sweep that away, but once the colonies were gone in 1949, the, the Netherlands no longer retained the same colonial ambitions, for example, that France or the UK would, at least for the next decade or two. Neither was it, however, occupied as Germany or Austria were. So there's some very kind of unique, special categories for the Netherlands, as, as other people, uh, someone else has put it. The biggest of the small powers, the smallest of the big powers. Um, um, I also need to point out that I'm not an IR theorist. I'm not a political scientist. I'm a historian. And so some of the debates are uh, a little bit sterile to me. Um, uh, I appreciate this distinction between empire and hegemony. Um, uh, on some level, uh, if you want to say that the difference between empire and hegemon is that empires, and you, you kind of alluded to this, Norris, in your comment, that empires always insist on getting their way. Hegemons sometimes have to put up with recalcitrant allies. Um, that's a distinction that works if you're white. That's a distinction that works for the European clients. That's not a distinction that works um, pretty much anywhere else in the world where state sovereignties were regularly and routinely ignored by the American empire. And in that sense, when it comes to huge swaths of the rest of the world, Latin America, of course, Southeast Asia, of course, many parts of Africa, 
um, uh, uh, the Americans routinely ignored that. And uh, I, I can't accept an argument that says that the United States is um, hegemonic to uh, white people and imperial to people of color. It seems to me that we have an empire here that is more dynamic and um, uh, more interesting than the traditional model of, say, a Roman style conquerors. And so I would say that uh, for me, empire works very well because it describes uh, the global ambitions of the United States. They are global. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why some uh, IR uh, people, political scientists, much prefer the term hegemon. Um, although the two are, I mean, the two are certainly compatible with respect to 19th century Great Britain. I mean, people routinely talk about the British Empire and the British hegemony over global capitalism in the 19th century. So I'm not sure that the two are exclusive. At least I don't see it that way. he puts empire in inverted commas. I know this might be uh, somewhat of a cop-out, but uh, when you look at the research uh, carried out by Odar Nevesta about the global Cold War, uh, he, he doesn't really challenge the, the empire. He challenges the by invitation aspect, as, as you alluded to in America's relations with countries beyond, uh, beyond Western Europe. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Professor Jarle Siemensen. He's a professor of history. I'm also interested in uh, the definition of concepts. But first, clientage is a very productive uh, concept in your analysis and original. And it should be brought into all sorts of uh, hierarchical analysis, including colonial rule for that matter. There is clientage even within colonial rule. But uh, back to uh, um, the concept of empire, I agree that you stretch the concept, that it is frequently stretched to a degree which rather does not illuminate but uh, evades a proper definition. In uh, British colonial history, I have a certain background in colonial history. Uh, there is, of course, the concept of um, free trade imperialism, informal uh, imperialism mm -hmm. in British policy, mid 19th century, for instance, in West Africa, but in much of Asia, the pre-colonial period, uh, where power is used to uh, promote, to open the countries and promote free trade. But it is particular use of power, it is a def definite imposition a threat implied, a cannon boat, or a sanction, a cursive sanction of some sort. To uh, stretch the concept into all fields where there are different power relations obscures. There was, for instance, a, a certain fashionable use of um, cultural imperialism to characterize, including Christian missions. Now, there is influence that can be influence without power. There can be influence based on attraction, on admiration. Uh, you can't uh, uh, use the two on the whole, I didn't hear much about influence in your talk. It was uh, rather power all along. So, uh, I'm, I'm, to, to I'm expecting you to, to, to remark to, to that you didn't hear much final... about power in my... Pardon? I'm expecting you to remark that you didn't hear much about power in my talk. I heard a lot influence. about power. Yes. You threw me a, I'm left another with, baseball metaphor. You I'm left a with the question, what uh, characterizes the sort of power that deserves the name imperialism. What um, does empire contain in addition to hegemony? Well, it certainly does contain power. I don't, 
I don't think an empire is a simple thing, and I don't think it's a two-dimensional thing. I think it's complicated, and I think it has power and influence along a number of axes and via a number of strategies. And I think that um, uh, this was not, this talk is not designed to come to terms with American imperialism in its entirety, which of course contains any number of examples of actual powers I alluded to earlier, including in this period, lots and lots of power. Um, what I think is interesting about this empire is that strict military power, which is what you seem to be alluding to, is not the only tool in that tool belt, and that imperial power can radiate in other ways as well, via culture, and of course certainly via the economy. I mean, the Marshall Plan, we keep coming, sort of returning to that, the Marshall Plan was a source of massive influence within the economies of the participating countries. And we tend to gloss over that as if this was money just sort of given, but the, the, the detailed integration of policy making and the way policy making, in my case, in The Hague, was run through and checked and verified and vetted by the Americans and vice versa is an enormous source of power. Americans have enormous propaganda power. The Marshall Plan, um, I'd have to think about this. I want to be careful about my claims because the Nazis were good propagandists and the British had their own. But the Marshall Plan certainly also um, was one of the great propaganda efforts of modern times. Whether it was the greatest propaganda effort, I, I don't know yet, but it was certainly one of the great propaganda efforts. Radio programs, films, all sorts of pamphlets, broadsides, all sorts of speeches, speeches that were laundered, if you will, given by local interlocutors on behalf of the Marshall Plan. This, it seems to me, is clearly a form of, of influence. I, I think we need to move away. I mean, I realize that the categories that I'm using do cross over with this discussion of hegemony. On some level, I'm not really too worried about those two concepts. I don't, I don't see that they're so radically different. Call it hegemony, call it empire, if you will. We're still talking about significant, significant power. Right? The, the, the states of Europe don't need to be subject to American gunboats any more than er, any, every client state of Rome was not subject to Roman legions. The enemies of Rome were subject to Roman legions, but the clients of Rome were not. They could be, potentially, but they weren't, at least for much of the Republican period. Very good. Uh, then a question from the director of the Nobel Institute, Olaf Nørstad. Thank you. Thank you, David, for an inspiring uh, talk. Um, raised a lot of questions also. Um, just a brief comment to P Professor uh, Siemensen's uh, remark. Uh, I think you may argue, Jarle, that power is not only a question about what you may oppose of threats and on, on someone, but also what you may deny them. And of course, uh, the United States could deny the European allies something they really wanted and needed, security. So there was a trade-off, I think, which, which involved power. But yeah, well, that's the question. Yeah, that, that's the question. And yeah, and um, I think m much of what you said is seems quite possible to apply on much of the U.S.-Norwegian relationships as well. And actually, one uh, Norwegian historian, uh, Kjetil Skogran, used clientelism as his analytical approach to his study on U.S.-Norwegian relations during the Korean War as a case study. Mm. Uh, quite interesting, and, and I, th I think it, it, it is a kind of concept and analytical tool we may, may, may use and explore further. Uh, I had the same question as Amari, uh, whether, this, whether you have tried to look at this in a broader perspective. Uh, whether it applies well to more cases, countries more different from Netherlands than Norway, for instance. That would be, would be interesting. Uh, but my question is rather, um, do you think that at some time, at some point in time, this clientelism relationship disappeared? I guess you will say yes. Disappeared? Yeah. As, as, as the 
as the, the really the essence of U.S. relations towards the, the European allies? And, and if so, when did things change and why? <laughs> That's, that's really a great question. I would answer that in two, uh, sort of two ways. One, and I, I, I cut it for reasons of length, but there's a, uh, a recent photo op, uh, Secretary of State Kerry with the Dutch foreign ministers about two, three weeks ago, and gave an impromptu little three-minute speech, but talked about um, uh, intertwining was the word that he used, that, that the U.S. and the Netherlands is, are still deeply intertwined on any number of issues from terrorism to trafficking to, to whatever it is. And it just struck me that it, it sounded very clientelist when you put it uh, uh, in those terms. Um, I would also respond with um, one of the great, maybe not so unanswered for some of you, but at least for me and for some of the people in whose circle I travel, one of the great unanswered questions of the early 21st century is why did Blair support the Bush decision to go into Iraq? What, at the end of the day, what were the British trying to get out of this deal? Why, you know, why, why is Blair Bush's poodle? And I don't know that I've ever read a satisfactory, to me at least, um, a satisfactory answer to that question, really, you know, other than sort of vague mumblings about the special relationship. But at the end of the day, that's all that, that um, at least in some of what I've read, uh, that's all that there is to it, that there's just such a deep pattern of clientelism woven deep into the tile at Whitehall that um, there's no other option. I don't, um, it, it's, a, it's a great question. I think obviously the, the Vietnam era and, and of course more importantly the Nixon era, the great kind of Nixon revision and resetting of, of American global commitments more broadly would require um, uh, further investigation as the clientelism there. Um, um, I did a, uh, an article a couple of years ago, and I alluded to it in this talk, on KLM, the Dutch airline, and the long dispute between the Dutch and the Americans about landing rights. KLM wanted landing rights in America. And de literally decade after decade, this went on for years and years and years and years. There was a breakthrough in 1957, but then still the dispute went on. And it wasn't until the Carter years and the Open Skies initiatives of the Carter years that the Dutch finally were, were uh, assuaged with what they got from the Americans. And that landing rights, we, we made sort of a, a metaphor, a case of a case, if you will, into Dutch clientelism. They kept expecting and demanding that they were going to get better treatment because, you know, we're your buddy after all. Uh, and it never happened well until the 1970s, the Carter ministers. So, I, yeah, I mean... Um, I, I don't know, but I think it would be fascinating. I think some of the indication, we've had talks just around the Institute here over the last couple of days, which suggests that what I'm talking about here is clearly a historical relic, and we are in a much different period now, for good or for ill. Professor Helge Faro. Thank you, David. Most interesting. Um, I think I'll have to think about your whether your new terms, how much they actually add to what we already have, are doing, um, but I can't do that mm. off the top of my head. Mm. But I would like to return to the empirical stuff. Um, and I'm, my, one, of my, one question is, to what extent is, would the Marshall Plan years really be representative of the relationship between the Americans and the Europeans? Um, I'm a bit doubtful. I mean, obviously there is the there is the NATO relationship, and there are other relationships as well. But the impact, broad impact of the Marshall Plan over number of aspects of post-war European societies, I think, quite different from the narrower foreign policy issues that characterize the the later relationship. I would think, not that the so sort of transnational linkages are getting any less. They, I mean, in fact, they're, they're, but the ability of the Americans to impact directly on the European recipients of the Marshall Plan really do not exist to the same degree outside of defense. Outside of defense. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, that's, and, I think but that's probably but clear, true. But as far as the Marshall Plan, you're, you're I think, largely right. In, in, uh, in uh, Norway, the, uh, the head of the American ECA mission could basically wandered in and out of the, of the Ministry of Finance and, and uh, 
participated very closely in discussions of reconstruction or, and, or, mm -hmm. and, and restructuring of the, of the Norwegian economy. There's no question about that. Um, there are some interesting differences with uh, regard to the Netherlands in the sense that um, with regard to um, productivity work and restructuring Norwegian industries, <coughs> certainly the, the, um, the Norwegian employers were very skeptical, where the trade unions were enthusiastic. Uh, and uh, American supermarkets came very quickly to Norway by the uh, cooperatives. Uh, so there, and I think so quickly to the Netherlands. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, but I'm, and of course, then there is a question of dog wags tail or the other way around. And the Norwegians, in some respects, the Norwegians were able to use the American very efficiently, and the Americans at times pushed the Norwegians around, but they weren't poodles. Um, and that goes for, um, for the uh, military relationship too with the restrictions on allied bases in, uh, in Norway, the uh, absolute refusal to think, even think about nuclear weapons in Norway with the exception of a of, of smallish group of politicians in the in Labour Party and the Conservatives. So I would, I'm a bit doubtful whether this clientism term is very useful beyond the Marshall Plan period, if, if it's intended to be broader than just um, security issues. Well, it's, a, it's, certainly, a fair, it's, it's certainly a fair point. Um, uh, uh, I won't argue that's sort of the main thrust. I would say that um, the cooperation on the security and defense matters, um, you cordon that off a little bit. That's pretty significant. That's, rather very significant, especially when you're talking about nuclear strategy, especially when you're talking about stationing nuclear missiles, uh, for example, on Dutch territory against the popular wishes of a lot of Dutch people, for example. So uh, I wouldn't quite so readily cordon off the defense side of things. Um, I will grant that in the immediate aftermath, you know, once the Marshall Plan wraps up in about 1953, the Netherlands is the first country to go off the Marshall Plan, if you will, that direct influence um, quickly goes by the boards, that's true. But by then, the, um, so many of the networks had already been established. So many of the academic and scholarly exchanges, um, so many of the, um, you know, the trade unions had made connections via the Marshall Plan. The, um, uh, so many of the business and corporate connections had already been, been made. So much direct American investment, for example, uh, I presume throughout Europe, I certainly know in the case of the Netherlands, you've got Coke and Ford and Remington and all kinds of American companies making investments, and of course that means a durable American, uh, a durable American presence. I find what's interesting here is, and I tried to I tried to capture this in this use of the word negotiation, that it, it, it seems it's almost a, a parlor game to try to find examples both of American influence and then those examples where the Europeans said no to the Americans. I don't know the Norwegian case, but if you tell me that, that Norwegians welcomed American supermarkets, I would find that very interesting because the Dutch emphatically rejected them. Um, there were any number of study trips that went over to American supermarkets. They sent, they sent reporters from women's magazines to look at the American supermarkets and the American kitchen, and um, these young female reporters were impressed with what they saw but rejected it as a model for the Netherlands. So none of this is meant to imply None of this is meant to imply control. None of this is meant to, you know, we can sort of, I think we need to talk more fully about what we mean by power and what we mean by influence. Um, uh, I think perhaps a fair way to say it is that the American presence, even after the years of the Marshall Plan, the American presence became a permanent part of the European experience in ways that could not just be dismissed. Even if it was denied or rejected, couldn't be ignored. And uh, to me, that's what makes it imperial. Difficult question. Uh, after, War, after, after World War, after World War II, the United States becomes a European power uh, by virtue of having a sizable part of its armed forces actually stationed in Europe. And I tend to believe that the uses of clientelism is uh, is appropriate. Uh, I think it's a, it's a good term uh, to, to describe the relation between the United States. And, uh, and its European allies. 
I would ask you to, could you please go deeper into uh, what I found to be the most interesting aspect of the talk, how the United States uh, inserted itself in Dutch politics, made an assessment, and then quite skillfully, by, uh, by your reckoning, I understand, uh, went about tipping the scales of power, making sure that the people that they wanted to, uh, to win actually won. Uh, but you did say that the United States in Italy pursued a much more dramatic uh, policy. Can you please explain to us how this less dramatic uh, uh, American influence peddling in the Netherlands worked in practice? Uh, and also, uh, if, if, if you could comment, and this is uh, sort of an, an easy question, very open-ended, why is the United States apparently not as good at that anymore. It seems that the United States now is still, you know, they're still trying to do this in countries such as Afghanistan and Iraq, identify the key players, strengthen them, all that, but with much less follow through than uh, the Dutch case would indicate. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm not sure that um, they've ever been particularly good at it. Uh, I'm not sure that the empires generally are always very good at reading the local scene, which is why the recourse to arms oftentimes comes up. Um, we, we think of empires in those terms. We think of empires in terms of the Roman legions, but Roman legions are expensive, right? And if the point of empire, as I take it, if the point of empire is to deliver benefits back to the metropolitan center at the lowest cost possible, then recourse to militarism should be the last option and not the first option, and, and that, in fact, is the case. In fact, that was the case, that was the argument that Gallagher and Robinson made so many years ago about the British Empire, that that arms was the was the you know the most the most uh, telegenic, if you will, charismatic part of uh, uh, the imperial strategy, but the least preferred. Um, I'm not sure that that empires are terribly good at it, though. Clearly, we've gotten a lot worse at it, um, and if we're witness to the decline and fall of the American Empire. I, that, that's the only speculation that I can that I can really offer. I would also suggest that um, what they did do, um, and here I'm just going to reverse myself a little bit. Um, the Americans became, at least for a time, briefly, pretty good political anthropologists. Um, the records, the the uh, correspondence between the local embassies, the local um, uh, Marshall Plan missions, were, were sort of briefs about local politics, and they weren't 100% accurate, but boy, there was, there was you know, you could, you could write a book just from those uh, uh, archival correspondence, and it wouldn't be too far off from the truth, I would think. So they understood, in some cases, where they needed to intervene more directly than in others. This is why I think they understood that um, if, if De Gasperi in Italy, and I'm drawing on uh, Mystery's new book here, if uh, uh, the Christian Democrats in Italy were to succeed, they're gonna need a lot more help. So a lot of what the Americans did early on in the Netherlands was simply reassure themselves that the Dutch were okay to deal with. Um, the Catholics were a problem for them because um, for a variety of very local Dutch reasons, the Catholics were not a very uh, dynamic party. They were certainly not an international party. Uh, they were not much interested in f uh, foreign affairs until uh, the mid-50s. They finally got a Catholic minister, foreign minister in there, uh, Joseph Lunds. But until then, the Catholics were largely, I think, immune uh, uh, to the American presence other than a few ministers. Um, I, I would say, I, I think I cited the, probably the single best strategy, which was to select young leaders and then send them to the United States, either on a leader grant or uh, via the Marshall Plan mission, um, and therefore you know, offer some sort of prestige to them. Um, uh, this was done dramatically some years later. Both um, Thatcher and I believe Blair were both identified as very young MPs and both took um, uh, study trips, leader trips to the United States with the express purpose of when they came back that they would have that imprimatur of the experience having studied abroad. I think a lot of what the Americans did with respect to, um, to labor as well, so this is indirect, again, much less splashy than the Italian scene, but to convince the Dutch labor unions, the Socialist Union, the Protestant Union, and the Catholic Union Federation that Marshall Plan money and American support for Dutch defense was not gonna dramatically lower Dutch living standards. And so the purpose there was less to promote 
the Social Democrats or the Catholics than to diffuse support for the communists. The communists had won a fairly significant, not a victory, but they had won a significant uh, portion of the vote in 1946. In the Netherlands, of all places, in the quiet, placid Netherlands, the communists had won 10%. And communists had been successful throughout Europe. But the Americans were constantly on guard for radicalization among the unions. And as long as the Dutch showed that they were going to accept the logic of the Marshall Plan and NATO, then a little bit of propaganda was about enough. I don't think there were deep-seated machinations. I don't think the Americans, I don't see any evidence of that, although I have not spent years and years in the CIA archives. Um, there's still information in the CIA archives about what happened in Italy or France, and we have no idea the black bag operations that went on there. I don't have any indication of secret cash payouts or anything like that. Um, so less, less directly involved, but I think the American presence is, is still pretty clear. It's indirect, but clear. Professor Snyder, or Dr. Snyder, it has been a pleasure to have you here at the Nobel Institute. Uh, David Snyder will absolutely be absolutely my pleasure. Will be here with us for a few more weeks. If anybody has more questions, uh, you're welcome to uh, come over and discuss it over lunch. Thank you very much for attending. But goodbye. Thank you.